Yes. Okay. Yes. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if we have a little time left at the end, we'll maybe take one or two questions from the audience. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with Dennis Lehane. Uh, the topic today is New England Noir. We'll probably uh, spend some time on that and also uh, talk about Dennis's latest book, Since We Fell, a bit as well. Uh, Dennis is the author of more than a dozen books and has won numerous literary awards, too many to list here, uh, has had incredible book to film success. Uh, a number of his have become household names like Mystic River and Shutter Island. He's written for television, including Boardwalk Empire, one of my favorite shows of all time, and The Wire, uh, also very popular, uh, and has done some teaching as well of writing, among other places at Harvard. Uh, so, starting off with New England Noir, uh, I think the obvious place to start is, what is New England Noir? I have no idea. I, I, <laughs> I think it's a, it's, um, look, I'm, I'm a big believer in labels, um, if they help sell my books. So, you can call it whatever you want. If, if somebody purchases it, well done. Um, I don't know. I guess it's. Uh, I, I feel like if I do any, I, and I do feel like I write a lot of noir, as I understand noir, which, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about what noir is. Um, but I feel like if I do it, I do Boston noir. New England to me, New England feels pastoral to me. New England feels like Yankee Magazine. Do you guys know Yankee Magazine at all? That's what it feels like. It feels like my sister. My sister um, lives in the suburbs, and and she wears a lot of LLB. When I think of New England, I think of my sister. When I think of me, and I think very much of Boston. So, um, but in general, it just means um, uh, noir in which uh, people are cold and repressed. That's <laughs> New England. <laughs> you know. do, do you bring Bo so many of the books are set there? It almost becomes like a, a character in the book mm -hmm. in a way that when place becomes very important to what's driving the book forward. Yeah, I, I, I'm very place centric, and I and I. Now that I don't live in Boston anymore, I live in Los Angeles, I, I miss it so terribly that I've decided I will never write anything that isn't set in my novels in Boston ever again. That's like the one thing I know for sure. Um, I just, you know, nobody gets my jokes in LA. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody's like, like, you know, why are you so edgy? I'm like, edgy, I'm just from Boston. Like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, um, yeah, I, 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 um, I feel like it's just, Boston itself is, is, to me, is my wellspring. And I don't feel like I need to go get water from somebody else's well mm -hmm. until mine is empty. And so, and I just, I, it's the only thing I'm proprietary about, too. At, period. I don't care what type of novelist you call me. I don't, you know, I don't care if, if, if I get literary cred. I don't care if I get noir cred, whatever it is. I very much care. If somebody says, oh, there's this uh, great writer just came out of Boston, I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm immediately like Montana versus Steve Young. I'm immediately competitive. I'm like, oh, really? And what is this book about, pray tell? What is the young lad doing? Um, so. Yeah, that's, that's funny. It. Well, I'll stay out of Boston. All mine have been set either entirely or in parts in Manhattan. I had this friend who describes Manhattan as you know, it's like this giant cruise ship, and we're all living in these tiny little cabins, but who cares, because all, all the fun's out on the decks anyway. Oh, you that's know? a good way so, to put it, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. what we tell ourselves anyway in Manhattan. So we come out to Palm Springs, and we look around like, what am I doing living in Manhattan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in your latest book, Since We Fell, uh, one, of the, one of the things that's interesting with your, with your books generally is that there's the main thrust of the mystery and in addition to that, in parallel, your characters all have their own internal struggles and puzzles they're trying to piece together. Right. And in this book, the opening quarter or so of the book, we go deep into Rachel uh, and her, her Boston roots. Uh, can you describe your thoughts and structure in the book that way? And I also read that, in part, the inspiration from that came from another New England writer, John Irving, uh, in the way that you, you sort of set up the opening of the book. Well, there was a, um, uh, I did, actually, I felt the opening was most inspired by the opening of Psycho. Um, so the opening of Psycho, you watch 20 minutes before Janet Lee gets to that motel. And I love that. It's my favorite part of that movie. 
Um, she embezzles the money. She drives around San Francisco. You know, you think you're watching a completely different movie. And then she goes to that motel, and you're like, what's going to happen? Is she going to get caught? And, she, and then she gets killed. And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Which, if you had seen that movie in 1960, it must have just been, to me, so thrilling. And I love... I love needle scratch is what I call needle scratch art. Like you, like that moment in a record where you just, and then or the song changes. And I and I love books and I love films that that lead me in to what could be a potentially very different experience than I thought. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing with the first eighty of this. Is it seems as if it's a different book, and so then you get into the what people have called in reviews the main action. And it's like, no, actually, the, the, if you study the book correctly, the main action actually begins on page seven. You just don't see it. Mm -hmm. I just, I completely buried it. Mm -hmm. And so then you look back and you go, oh, oh, wait a minute. So chronologically, you can see where the main action began. But I wanted mm -hmm. to do a book that started off as kind of a, a seemingly just a straight up character study about a woman who is on a search um, not only for her identity, she doesn't know who her father is, and her mother has told her she knows exactly who her father is, but she isn't going to tell her. So that tells you about the mother-daughter dynamic, which I was fascinated with um, at that point. And, um, and, then, uh, and then she's also then grappling with, she goes on this journey to figure out who her father is, but then she also just goes on this journey to figure out why people continually abandon her. And that's what, it's very much a book about abandonment. And um, or she, that's, how she per, that's how she internalizes it. So then it becomes very much about, um, as, as she goes further into the world, she becomes a journalist, and then she ends up working a job in a country that has been completely abandoned, which is Haiti after the earthquake. And that I'm, I've always been inter very interested in the way the global can intersect with the personal. Mm -hmm. And so the, the global intersects with her personal sense of abandonment, and she has a mental breakdown. And then, and then the action kicks up again. Now she's agoraphobic. She's married to a wonderful guy. But if you're agoraphobic, I kept asking myself, if you're agoraphobic, what is your primary fear outside of being afraid of going outside? Mine would be that there's a whole other world going on out there that nobody's telling me about. That's the trick. If you can't leave the house, somebody can tell you anything. You know what I mean? They can be like, oh, you know, I, I just I saw Tom Hanks today. You'd be like, really? He was just walking through the streets of Boston. He sure was. There's nothing you can do. You'd be like, I, I, I guess I'll look it up on the internet, but I'll believe you. Um, so there's, there's an ability to lie at that level, and I just thought, okay, this is a book about trust. What if then she finally walked outside and saw something she didn't expect to see because it wasn't where it was supposed to be? And that became the thrust of the book. She walks outside, and she sees something, and she says, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, one of the things I thought was interesting is this, in, in the beginning, she has this search to find her biological father, whom she has never known. And juxtaposed with that, she, she's trying to get to know her father, but she's also trying to get to know the people who are flesh and blood in her present day life. And it's tough to know in which area she's more successful, you know, mm -hmm. in, in terms of who she's really getting to know. Uh, in some ways, it seems like there are aspects of a person you can get to know better in their absence, when they're not there to launch countermeasures and lies. Well, and also there's this idea. The other thing about knowing people or not knowing people that I find fascinating, Cormac McCarthy wrote one of my all-time favorite lines in Blood Meridian. Um, how, are, how is a man to know his mind when his mind is all he has to know it with? <laughs> how are we supposed to... If, how can we know anybody if we don't ultimately really know ourselves? And I think that people come within... You know, that you come somewhere on a curve of how well you know yourself... But I think the vast majority of people, I agree with Freud, are unconscious. And they act from the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And so if they don't know themselves, you're just trying to get to know your own damn self. How are you yeah. supposed to know somebody else? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 does, it becomes a central, I, I think, obsession that does show up in a lot of my work, is mm -hmm. people who are right in front of you. I wrote a line in, in a book I'm kind of been noodling on for the last couple of years. And I wrote a line, it's amazing how how the people you know can disappear right in front of your face. Mm -hmm. And that's it, you know? Um, so that becomes another thing. There's a lot in here about, you know, is she paranoid or is the world really out to get her? Yeah. You know, so. Well, speaking of lines, there's one I loved from page two that sets up so much of what comes later. 
from Elizabeth Childs, the mother of Rachel, our protagonist. A man is the stories he tells about himself, and most of these stories are lies. Never look too closely. If you uncover his lies, it'll humiliate you both. Yeah. Can you talk about how that sets up so much of what comes later with Brian? And also, really, it's ironic that that's the advice coming from the mother who has spent all of Rachel's childhood spinning a web of lies around Rachel that, when uncovered, humi humiliates them both. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth Childs, who's Rachel's mother, who dies on page, I think, six or seven, uh, and then casts a shadow over the rest of the book, is, is a real piece of work. And she... Um, the, the line I liked about her, the line I liked that I wrote about her was, um, she's a brilliant psychiatrist. So this woman, the line is, um, this woman who was brilliant at analyzing the problems of others um, uh, had no idea uh, how to analyze those of herself. So she spent the, her entire life looking for solutions to problems that began, uh, flowered, and ended in her own marrow. That's it, this, this idea of somebody just projects out, projects out, projects out. And her pathology is to say to Rachel consistently, um, I know exactly who your father is. I'm not going to tell you. It's good for you that you don't know. And, and which I just thought was insane. I thought it was one of the most evil act of almost anybody I've ever created in a book. And mm -hmm. after the book came out, the number of people who came forward and told me that that was their life was breathtaking. Wow. I mean, breathtaking. It was, it was like it started with the very first person who ever took me around on, my, on the first bookstore I went to outside of Boston. She was like, that's exactly what happened to me. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then it just went on. I started to get letters. I started, this is a common pathology, apparently, where people say, I know who your father is. Nah, 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 nah. I'm not telling you. Uh, I, I was shocked, and some people went to their graves with it. And, and I just, I find that just hideous. Um, so, yeah, so that opens up a whole opaqueness in the book. Rachel just can never break through. Yeah. Um, there's a line uh, in the book uh, that I thought was very telling. I think it ends the first part, which is Rachel once again on the wrong side of the mirror. And that, and that mm -hmm. becomes her journey. She's just always on the wrong side of the mirror. There's always this whole other storyline going on that she's just not privy to. She's just blocked out. And I think... You know, again, that, that maybe I'm just really cynical, but that, um, I don't think I'm cynical. I think I'm skeptical. But that, uh, that, that reinforces a lot of things I feel about the way the world works, that I just, I feel is also one of the things I really believe, I believe this to my heart and soul now, and, you know, having been on this earth a long time and having thought a lot about America, but also other countries, I believe our myths are far more important to us than our truths. Mm -hmm. And I believe that to our core. I believe that if you sit there and you hand somebody a truth versus their myth, they're going to sit there, and if that truth is even a little bit inconvenient, they're going to be like, thank you. I'm going to now hold on to my myth. I need my myth. And right. I think that is true globally. I don't think that's an American problem. I think that is a national, I mean, I think that is a global problem. And that is what nations depend on mm -hmm. to govern people, is to just say, what do you want? You want the truth or you want the myth? And people are like, myth, please. Myth, you know. and please reinforce that again and again. Yeah, and again yeah. and again and again, so I can sleep tight, so I can, I can feel my, my, my life has value, my life has meaning, you know? So. I, I love that line again, so I, I double underlined that one in the beginning, and I think it's something everyone can connect to in, in some way, not necessarily that our loved ones are uh, living a pack of lies, but I do think we allow in intimate relationships some privacy, uh, for yeah. each other, like a, a bit of a secret life. And then we just hope it's not some bizarre double life. But with Rachel... Well, you got little kids, right? Three. And I have yeah. little kids. Yeah. And you already see it in little kids. You see it. You see them beginning to build their private life. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I say to my daughters all the time, I will respect your privacy as long as you respect mine. Mm -hmm. And don't ever give me a reason not to trust you. And we're good. I'll never look in your diaries. I'll never look... I will not do any of this. But don't you dare walk up when I'm texting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> it goes both ways, my friends. Um, but I see very clearly, even within that, and I respect them very deeply uh, on, on their privacy. I think it's important. But I can see them already building a private self, mm -hmm. which is very different. And per certainly my nine-year-old, she's already in there. She's like, you know, no, Daddy. I'm like, why didn't you tell me that? She's like, I'm not going to tell you that. I'm like, why? Because <laughs> you're a daddy. 
oh, okay, you know, I'm going to call your mother. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, you see it, and, and, and it's a beginning of who am I? And how do mm -hmm. I build who, who this person is? And then they also are dealing with, and, unless they're, I guess, homeschooled, they're also dealing with public versus private personas from first grade on. Mm -hmm. You know, because they have to go out there and they have to deal with 22 other kids. And there's a whole social strata going on there. Yeah. And they have to create a self, a, another self. And so immediately, I think by the time you're six years old, you've begun to create a divided self. Mm -hmm. So, you know. And then w with Rachel and Brian, she is allowing that he has this private self. But alarm bells are going off a little bit of, so she's, she's sort of constantly walking this line of, am I allowing too much intentional ignorance of what this man may have going on, or is it just sort of an allowable uh, private self that he has? Yeah, yeah, which is a relationship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really? That, wouldn't you think so? Um, I think there's a, there's a sense in any relationship that, you know, if we get, again, we're back to that the concept we talked about earlier. Even if you say, I know 90% of the person, what if the person only knows 50% of themselves? Mm -hmm. Well then, on and on and on, you know, so. So early in the book, Rachel's dating a young man named Patrick who never feels that he's in her league uh, as someone to be dating. And on page 27, Patrick tells Rachel why he thinks she ever dated him in the first place, saying to her, you value safety over love. Mm -hmm. And do you think Patrick is, is he correct in his assessment of Rachel that time? And, and through the course of the book, does that change? I think absolutely at that point, Rachel values safety over love, which is, I'll give you another, I'll get, uh, another article I came across two years ago, which was fascinating to me. Um, the, ar <laughs> um, the article was, uh, why, why you are doomed to marry the wrong person, right? <laughs> I've been divorced twice, so I'm fascinated with this. <laughs> so, uh, I, and, uh, and, and what it said, which was, it was so spot on. We tell ourselves when we go into a relationship that we are searching for love. We are not. We are searching for home. So your ability to have a successful relationship with somebody else is all based on how successful your upbringing was, period. What is your home? What was your home? If you're searching out the familiar and the familiar is dangerous and untenable, then guess what your marriage is going to be? And guess what your relationships are going to be? And I just became fascinated by that concept because it's like we say we're looking for love, but we're not. Mm -hmm. We're looking for the familiar. Mm -hmm. So raise your children correctly <laughs> is the big one. <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I became fascinated by that concept. And I think that's, that went into, I'd read that article by the time I wrote that line. Mm -hmm. Rachel is not looking for love early in this book. She thinks mm -hmm. she is. Yeah. But if you look, her series of decisions she makes with men are wrong. Mm -hmm. They're wrong for the wrong reason, uh, for the different reasons. The first yeah. guy she picks is a safety guy. The second guy she picks is extremely distant, mm -hmm. disconnected. And then the third guy she picks may be the right one, but yeah. not, it ain't going to be an easy ride. So along those same lines, but coming at it from a different angle, is the character Haya. And you have great reveals mm -hmm. uh, with her. And as a con artist herself, she's able to see yeah, straight off. Spoiler that, alert. <laughs> yeah, Big spo spoiler <laughs> alert. Damn it. <laughs> Okay, uh, but she, she basically, in a, in a way, she, it sort of takes one to know one. Yes. And she is not in love. She is not able to be easily deceived you know, because there is no intimacy there where someone has the leverage to be able to deceive her. Yeah. Um, is she, I, I was wondering, is she sort of out there as a contrast to Rachel of, of sort of takes one to know one versus Rachel's not in that position? Or is she more a hint that all along Rachel really has been very willfully ignorant, very intentional in what she doesn't know. I think there's a willful, I think Rachel's chosen ignorance. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a willful ignorance that happens. Once she gets agoraphobic, she chooses, she chooses not to see. Yeah. And, and, then, and then all of a sudden she wakes up, and waking up's great, but it, it can also be very painful. It can lead to a yeah. lot of side effects you encounter. on. So. The, the uncovering of it all is pretty shattering for her. And I, I read this book months ago, and I know you wrote it years ago, so yeah. it predates a lot of what's been in the news cycle. But as I had read it and then was having things come back in the news cycle, like Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby and Les Moonves, oh, I kept thinking about... Oh, there's a character in here who's based on Bill Cosby. I will say that. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, well, let's round back to that. But I, uh, I kept thinking about this book as I was watching this stuff in the news cycle because, the, and I know the gender can be flipped on, on this stuff, but those are just sort of the big three ones at that time. And, you know, the wives would come out, and I kept thinking, like, is this more of a Rachel or more of a Haya or somewhere in between? Mm. And you've gotten so into the psychology of this. You know, half the world looks at, at Harvey Weinstein's wife and says, this poor woman, you know, she was deceived. And then the other half's like, she knew, you know, this was like part of a, you know, an understanding that she must have known and been more I don't like know a higher. I don't know that she knew that Harvey was, was uh, as violent, of, you know, this, this violent rapist, which is mm-hmm. what seems to be coming out. I, I think she, she made her deal with the devil, though, in terms of the, this guy's never going to be faithful to me. Mm-hmm. I think she knew that. Um, I, you know, I mean, I think that was a, you know, so th- there is that, you know, you can't be sitting there with Babe in the Woods look on your face like, I had no idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you did. <laughs> uh, but did you have an idea of the depths? Yeah. Well, no, I could believe maybe she didn't because yeah. who would knowingly marry that level of a monster if all of this stuff is true? Yeah. Um, but we, you know, that, that stuff, the Me Too stuff when it came out, it, it blew up where I was at this very star-studded event that Harvey was supposed to be at. And, and he had a bail at the last second for obvious reasons. And, and then people started talking. There was a lot of us together. A lot of people were talking about this and whether they had been assaulted, whether they hadn't been assaulted, whether they knew Harvey, whether they didn't know Harvey. And, and then the men started talking about it. And I ended up having this conversation with, of all people, John Hamm, the guy who was on Mad Men. And both of us were just kind of like, I, we were raised, you know, our mothers raised us properly. It's not an issue. It was a mom thing. It's not about your dad. It's, you know, it's how did your mother raise you? If your mother raised you properly to respect women, you're not going to be Louis C.K. You're not going to be Charlie Rose. You're not going to be Harvey Weinstein. You're just not. I, I really do feel that in my heart and soul. I just feel like, no, and there's nobody who's going to be coming out of the woodwork. There may be people who come out of the woodwork and say, I said politically incorrect things. That's why I'll never, you know, my friends are like, you should, you know, at one point they were like, you should run for mayor. And I'm like, good God, have you seen our texts? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> no way, you know, but, uh, but I think that's, that's the, or, or like, I'll give you an example. When Trump described grabbing them by the, you know, as locker room talk, right? I, have a, I had a weekly poker game for 10 years. Our rule was you can say anything, anything. We were multiracial, so guess what? A lot of racial jokes went back and forth, a lot. All of these things. We used to say anything in this room ever got recorded, none of us are running But not for a bad office. word about Boston anywhere no, no, in there. Oh, no, no, you can never be that. No, you can never say that. It may be the Bruins, but that was it. Uh, <laughs> but, but the point was is in all that time, in all that really, really macho talk, uh, we would say object. We would say objectifying things. We would say, you know, racially insensitive things. These guys, we never, and I mean ever, said anything that approached that. Yeah. Grab them by the pee. Rape jokes. Violent jokes about women. None of it. Yeah. Did we say objectifying things? Absolutely. Guess what? I've hung around a lot of women who say very objectifying things about men too. I'm good with it. Let's go mm-hmm. back and forth. But there's a line, and if you don't know the line, yeah. you're the problem period. And I just felt that about the Me Too movement. It yeah. was just sort of like um, what my, my assistant said about Louis C.K. and the masturbating you know, around in front of people. She said, um, you know, um, I don't know. Maybe he didn't get along with his parents. I said, um, I said, I didn't get along with my parents. All that led me to do was buy two houses for women I don't really get along with. There's <laughs> a big leap between that and something else. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I just feel like, again, you know the line. And if you don't know the line, you're the problem. Yeah. So. Well, that was a fun tangent. Yes. That's um, good. Oh, well, we got to go. Yeah. No, uh, about that. <laughs> right. On that note. <laughs> yes. Uh, so. As you wrote the opening of the book, there are so many twists and turns mm-hmm. with, with Brian's, you know, not again, spoiler, frauds and all, all these things that come potential, more toward the potential, potential frauds, alleged, may alleged. have happened, may not. Yes. But as you write the opening of the book, do you know where all this is going or do you sort of turn the pages of this thing and sort of create as you go? Are you, are you an outliner? No, I, I don't outline at all. Well, I'll give you a, a, a strange thing. Um, I, I never outline my books, which is why they take a long time. Um, uh, but it's the only way I can write. Uh, I outline 
because I was trained. I was trained as a, as a, as a writer of TV or, or, or film by The Wire. That's where I was trained. So I was trained in a writer's room where we outlined everything, and you end up with a beat board. And um, uh, I cannot write a line of a script, even to this day, without li outlining. I outline it to an inch of its life, mm -hmm. and then I write it. The writing usually takes me the one third of the time of the outlining. I don't ever out outline a book. All I know about a book is I know usually one thing in the beginning to get me started, one thing in the middle, because it's a long haul, you need mm -hmm. something in that middle, and then one thing at the end. That's amazing. That's and then great. I just sort of kind of fill in the blanks. It is, you know, it's just, it's a terrible way to write a book. I don't recommend it. I really don't. <laughs> I just don't know how to do it any other way. Yeah. I, you know, and that's why, again, we were talking earlier about my homeroom class, what I call my homeroom class. And so there was a group of us writers who came up together. And we were all came up in the early 90s together, and the vast majority of us became successful. And so it's a very strange homeroom class to have, is what, that's what I call it. But it was myself, Laura Lippman, Lee Child, George Pelicanos, Michael Conley, Harlan Coben and Shira Roseanne. And we were just, all of us, the, you know, we were that pack who were at the low end of the totem pole at the early mystery writers conventions in the mid 90s. We were selling them out of the trunk of our car, you know, looking at these guys who were, you know, we'd be sitting there and you'd sign like three books and you'd look over and Mary Higgins Clark had a line going like <laughs> somewhere out to the Las Vegas line, like, it, you know, just, um, and, and it was, uh, you know, that was us. And now we've all become um, pretty successful, you know? Yeah. Um, here's the difference between me and my homeroom class. They've all written t twice as many books as I have. Every single one of them. And, and Harlan's written like five times. And Michael, I think, has written somewhere around four times is what I've written. But I just can't produce at the level that everybody else produces. Pro maybe because I don't outline. Maybe because I don't think I plot particularly well. I don't think I plot very well. I just don't. I think that you look at my, most of my books and you, there's always a moment where you go, let's just skip past that. Because <laughs> I'm not really interested in, in plot at the end of the day. I, I feel like plot is a, is, a, is a car. It's a serviceable vehicle. And all I need it to have is four wheels and, an, and a drive shaft. And that's it, and brakes. And, and then I'm good. I don't need it to be anything sp souped up. I don't need it to be pretty. I just need it to do its job. Because what I'm really interested in is the effects of what happened on the main people. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just very character driven. And a lot of times I can be excited about a plot, like, hey, I got a great idea. And I'm 50 pages in and I'm like, I don't care. And if I feel I don't care, then I stop. And then it just stops and then it just stops. And then mm -hmm. it, it takes, so it takes a lot for me to produce a book. In this book, this is the first book that you've written from a female perspective. All that, of, yeah, yeah. I've written in female point of view in Mystic River a lot, but not to the degree that I wrote a whole book. Is that how, how different? Do you have to, are you like a method actor getting into character beforehand? Or yes. how do you, uh, how <laughs> Every do you do day that? I got my sweaty Bettys and my Lululemons <laughs> and I <laughs> teased my hair and I... Um, <laughs> no, I am not. I, um, here's what I realized, because I, I got this question a lot. You know, uh, was it hard to be a woman? No, not at all. It was not hard at all. Um, and it wasn't hard. I wrote a large portion of my longest book, 700 pages. I wrote at least half, 50% of that book was from an African-American um, machinist's point of view in 1920 Oklahoma. I mean, is where the book starts. And, um, and I thought, Ooh, that wasn't hard either. No problem. So what's hard for me? Oh, insiders. Rachel's an outsider. All my main characters are outsiders. They're on the wrong side of the glass looking in. If, if, I, if I have that, if I lock in there, I'm great. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what that feels like. What would be impossible for me to write? Eric Trump. <laughs> could never write Eric Trump. I could never write an insider. I could never write somebody who grew up with a silver spoon in their mouth unless they were the black sheep of the family. Then I could do it. But it always has to, I always have to be in the shoes of the outsider for a main character. And all of my main characters, if you, if you break it down, Mm -hmm. With the exception of the lead Caucasian in the given day, is more he's he's the most of an insider I've ever written. He's from sort of police royalty, mm -hmm. and and so he's a successful police officer, and his father is a captain, and he grew up with a slight silver spoon in his mouth. He was the most difficult I ever had to write a character. 
the most. I had a hard time identifying with him. I was like, I don't know if this guy's, he's good looking, he's physically strong, he's a good boxer, he's smart, he's charming, everybody likes him. I'm like, screw him. I mean, I don't like this guy. <laughs> it's a lot of work to get into his skin, you know, where, you, again, you give me somebody who's cast aside, I, I got that, yeah. you know. So. Will we be seeing Rachel and Brian nope. going forward in another book, or this is the end of the, end of the, the line? This is the end of the line. Maybe end we'll see the them in film. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. There's, there's some talk. Let's see what happens. I, uh, so we were talking earlier about this. You had a very funny line that I came across that said, and this is going back some years, you said you had no desire to write the screenplay for a book-to-film treatment of one of your books because you didn't want to operate on one of your babies. Right. But I, I'm also now reading that you're heading up the, the writing for the film effort of this book. So why, why the change there? Well, never say never in the first place. I mean, right. just never. Um, but also, no, because I just I became, over the course of the last 13 years, um, I, I got confident with screenwriting. Suddenly, I knew how to do it. You know, I was like, oh, I can operate on this. It's not, also, I had kids. And I'm like, that's a book. I'm not a kid. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I can work with it. I can throw that out. Um, so I, just, I started to know how to do it, I think, was the, is the simple answer. I just got to where, as a screenwriter, you know, um, I, you know I, I wrote on The Wire, and then I wrote A Boardwalk Empire, and then I worked on a TV show called Bloodline, and I, I did a lot of um, consulting on a lot of shows. They, they started to figure out I had a rep for being able to kind of write the ship in a troubled room. So I would come in and I would work for an, a month to help out somebody, you know, kind of figure out the writer's room. And then I ran, a, uh, I, I became the chief writer on a TV show called Mr. Mercedes, and I wrote... Um, everything the first season on that and then I became the showrunner in the second season and I wrote every script had to go through me I was the coffee filter everything had to go through me and at one point I realized I was writing I was writing episode seven I was doing I was addressing production notes in episode five I was doing rewrites on episode six and then I was dealing with touch up work on episode four and this was literally all in the same week just go 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 and that becomes your 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I just woke up and I was like, I think I know how to write scripts. I'm good now. You know, I got it. And then that, it was around the time they said, do you want to do the adaptation of Since We Fell? And I was like, I'll take the check. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. So I feel comfortable now doing it. I, um, do you find now that you prefer doing it uh, to writing the novel? Um, it's easier and again I have these two little girls and I here's the difference a, a book takes a ton of emotional and s mental concentration for me mm -hmm. for me I'm, plenty of other people I know don't, they don't have this problem I do um, I, I need to be intensely focused and hopefully working as soon as I get out of bed in the morning like that's where I want to be I want to be as close to the dream state as I can be to write a book I don't remotely have that problem when I write a script. So which is easier in terms of, oh, I gotta drive my kids to school, I gotta get, make my kids breakfast, I gotta drive them to school, then I gotta go to work. Well, if I do that with a book, most of the books got out of my head by the time I get to my desk at 9 a.m. If I do that with a script, I'm like, yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. Or another thing is, is I can only write books in the morning or very late at night. I could write a script two o'clock in the afternoon on the 50 yard line of a Super Bowl. I, I just, uh, I, it, it's a different type of concentration. It feels, um, scripts feel more academic to me. I don't just feel as emotionally invested. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is because one of the hardest things for me as a writer is, um, is what I call uh, uh, painting the scene. So what would be extremely hard for me would be, would be describing this room right now, all of you in it, describing it in such a way and keeping the action moving with the main characters and how this would apply to the main characters and why they're even in this room, all of that. That would take me, that could take me weeks. It literally could. Um, for a, a, a film, interior, conference room, day. Right, go. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Moving yeah. on. Yeah. That's 30 seconds. Yeah. So... Yeah, it's a, well, what does it look like? Set decorator's problem, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> a lot of white chairs, <laughs> moving on. Um, so uh, that gets me right into the meat of it, which is where I feel like I'm most 
comfortable and at ease, which is, um, oh, two people talking. What about the collaborative elements, though, of a writer's room versus, you know, you're the only guy with the hands on the wheel doing the novel? So very different pride of ownership is how I'd put it. Very different. When you write a book, you're God. And, and every single inch of it is you. And when you hand it in, the only person it goes through, the only coffee filter it goes through is your editor, which is a relationship I feel very, is very sacred. But that's it. I don't take suggestions from my publisher. I don't take suggestions from my agent. And I never have. Mm -hmm. It's me and my editor. And that's it. And then the book's done. And you hand it over, and it's finite. The moment it shows up on a, on a shelf, it can't be changed, except by translations. So it is what it is. A movie or a TV show? Oh, dear God. No. You're one of 150 people. You're just the painter. You know, I mean, you came in and you painted a room. And you did it Dennis Lehane magenta, but that's all you did. Um, because there's a whole other bunch of people who will interpret that work. And there's budgetary constraints. And there's how the actor's going to take it, what the actor's going to do with it, what the set decorators are going to do with it. But the biggest one is budgetary constraints and scheduling. Mm -hmm. So there's a great line in Hollywood that a guy told me when I was working on Bloodline, and he'd, he'd done 30, he'd been in the business 30 years. He said, no matter what it is, sooner or later, it all comes down to interior kitchen day. <laughs> <laughs> you started out on the high seas at midnight in a boat with a cast of 20, and that scene ultimately, because of budgetary constraints or scheduling or just everybody's too tired, nobody wants to shoot it, just becomes interior kitchen day <laughs> Paul and Jane talk over a cup of coffee that's how it's done and, and it, Bloodline was a great example of that because Bloodline is a TV show that's set in Key West and we were constantly writing scenes on boats I mean because it's the keys it's the keys and we'd get these notes back are you kidding me night on the ocean on the ninth day of shooting and it would be like interior kitchen day <laughs> That's one of the reasons George Martin wrote um, Game of Thrones, uh, the, the books, game, the Game of Thrones books, because he said, I'm going to write unfilmable books, because he had just spent 10 years working in TV on a, on a TV show, and he got so tired of the constraints that he said, I'm just going to write books again, and they're going to be unfilmable. I'm going to put dragons in them. I'm going to go all <laughs> over the world. They're going to be 700 pages long, and nobody will ever film this. And then that's how we got Game of Thrones. That is hilarious. So, yeah. So we have a couple, a few minutes left for audi uh, audience questions, if there are any. Yes, and I'll repeat it. What was your favorite book that you wrote? What is my favorite book that I wrote? It's a tie, I think. Uh, it's either Mystic River or um, uh, The Given Day. Those are my two favorites. Those are the two best books, I think, that I've written, in I feel. But then, can you really trust the writer? Because I've, I've, no, because I've heard a lot of filmmakers or, or writers say what their favorite books are, or their favorites. I've heard, I've heard singers talk about what their best, or musicians talk about what their best albums are, and I'm like, not even close. Not even close. Mick Jagger thinks the Stones' best album is Steel Wheels. You're not even in the top five with that one. Like, but Mick thinks so. That doesn't make Mick right. So I feel like Mystic River and The Given Day are my best. Um, they weren't the funnest to write by any means. They were the most miserable to write, which I find is an interesting inverse relationship. I think if you're, I try to warn students about this. It, the most fun I've ever had writing books, one of them is my worst book. And it was a blast. It was a joy. And that should have been a big warning bell that it was shallow and facile and, and too easy to write. Um, I'm not going to say which book. <laughs> I want you to buy it and figure it out for yourselves. Then I have your money. Yes? How often do you go back to Boston? How often do I go back to Boston? Not as much as I want to now that I'm on the West Coast. I go back probably four times a year. I held on to my Patriot season tickets, and I, I take my daughters back to a Red Sox game every single year because their mother is a Yankees fan, and we're fighting for their souls. <laughs> Yes. So, yes, ma'am. Why the outsider? Were Why the outsider? Yeah, were you an outsider? Yeah, I was an outsider. I grew up in a working class neighborhood, the child of immigrants. Um, they never, I think ultimately immigrants never quite feel like they totally fit in. And so if you're your child, their children, you see that, you feel that. 
I grew up in a part of Boston where if you said you were from there, people backed up. I mean, they didn't mean to, but everybody did. Everybody. Somebody would say, oh, where are you from? Where are you from? I'd, I'd be like, Dorchester, and you'd get up one step, and then they'd check you for a weapon. You know, it's just kind of... <laughs> um, I, I just think that, I, I also think something very interesting, which was I, I had a very adult political thought when I, I grew up during um, the uh, desegregation of the Boston Public Schools. And so I watched that rip the city apart, absolutely tear the city apart. And I remember at one point I got, I was driving through a neighborhood and I got stoned, literally stoned. Like uh, I, we drove under a bridge and uh, there were these African-American kids up on the thing and they just shot us with rocks. And meanwhile, they were getting stoned going in on buses. They'd go into bus, be busted in white neighborhoods and people were throwing rocks at them. It was a hideous, hideous time to be growing up. And I remember my first adult thought, which was, why are we fighting each, each other? And I thought, it seems to me that it's in the best interest of the ruling class to keep the working class fighting amongst itself. And I had that thought at 10. And that has informed everything in my life ever since. And I have never been, felt that I've been proven wrong. Like I just look around the world. When I see the world through that prism, it just makes perfect sense. Of course, yeah, keep them fighting. Keep them fighting. Keep them thinking they're the enemy. And they'll never look at us. Great. So um, I think from that point on, I just never felt I fit anywhere. And I still don't. I, d I just don't. I have this, this weird thing of, um, you know, I, I, I fly very well, I drive nice cars, I do, you know, all of that. And yet, if you put me in a, if you put me in a nice place with nice china, I, I'm gonna break something. <laughs> I, I am, I'm just, I am gonna, I'm gonna screw it up somehow. Um, there's this moment, there's this movie nobody ever remembers now called Flamingo, uh, The Flamingo Kid with Matt Dillon. And he goes to, and he's like, like a, he's a valet or something, and he goes to date this very rich girl. And he's in her house, and he goes inside the, he's from Brooklyn, and he goes inside the bathroom, and all of a sudden he's like, oh my God, look at these soaps. These are incredible, these are individual soaps. Ma would love these. And he kind of looks around, and he, and he puts one of the soaps in his pocket, and he hears from outside, he hears the rich parents, and one of them says, where'd that kid go? And the mother goes, I don't know, he's probably in there stealing the soap. <laughs> 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 That just feels so me. That just, you know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very strange thing, but I, I've never gotten rid of the outside. I've never gotten inside me at all times is, a, is no matter what, is a poor working class kid. And I, and I don't feel like I, I'm, I'm, I feel like somebody's going to tell me to go around the back door. You know, and I've, I've never lost that feeling. And it, I'll tell you how bad it is. I, got, I, I was in a parking garage one time, and, I, and a guy came shooting out of a spot. He cut me off as I was driving through the parking garage. And I said, well, of course. He's driving an effing Ranger over. And then I thought, I'm driving an effing Ranger over. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think we have time for one more. Yes, ma'am. Um, I decided, uh, it's a two, that's a two-pronged question. When did I decide I wanted to become a writer? I wrote since I was eight, but it was not considered a viable career option where I came from. It just wasn't. Uh, my neighborhood was, uh, had only produced one famous person at that point. That was Donna Summer, uh, the disco queen. And, and this was pre-Wahlberg. Wahlbergs hadn't become the acting dynasty that they are now. Um, they came out of my neighborhood, and I came out of there. So... It just wasn't considered something you did. And, and so when I was 20, I dropped out of two colleges, had taken two safety majors, and, and I realized something wonderful, which I was talking about with somebody last night, which is I'm not good at anything else. I'm, I'm just not good at anything. There's nothing else. I, I have no other demonstrable talents except maybe you wouldn't want to shoot pool against me for money. But beyond that, that's it. And so I just, I said, um, I, th I think I got to focus on this writing thing. It's, the, it's, all I've, it's all I'm good at. And I went to my parents and I told them and they said, you know, which I, I love about them. I, I, I will, the act of bravery it took for them. They were immigrants. They were hoping I'm going to be the kid who's going to become a lawyer at least. And then they were just like, are you going to at least finish college? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> yes, I'll do that. And they were like, well, then well done. Do that. <laughs> and then hopefully you'll get a job. And so that was it at 20. And then from that point on, I remember thinking... I, I, I am never going back, ever. This is hell or high water. So, 
Dennis, you, you've timed it nearly to the second I here. Tried. I'm good. Uh, and they cut our mics, Bro. but are you going to have time to sign some books after? Yes, whatever you need. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you.